I would like to invite someone to the stage who has had a very long, illustrious clear career, dare I say, with the World Cocoa Foundation. Uh, but that is no longer the case. He's now with uh, World Lutheran Relief, or Chorus International, as you see here on the slide. Um, I will leave it to him to introduce the panelists, but I would ask you already for a warm welcome to Paul Mesek. You can hear me? Yes, good. I'll invite the panelists to come up, please, and then we'll introduce them. Like I said, or like Yost said, I'm Paul Masick with Chorus International, formerly with the World Cocoa Foundation. And we've got the great pleasure of uh, moderating a session for you on North American perspectives on issues of deforestation and human rights. And um, the World Cocoa Foundation's put together a very short but um, I think very informative history of U.S. trade policy as it relates to this issue. So we'd like to beg your attention for two and a half minutes to watch this slideshow, um, take it all in, and then we'll start the discussion. And I know um, we've had a lot of exciting discussion about due diligence, what that means in the context, particularly of U European Union trade policy, and we'll turn our attention in this final session of the, of the two-day conference to talk about U.S. perspectives. So if we could roll the slideshow, please. Great, thank you. So I hope you've all memorized that because we'll come back and I plan on asking a few quizzes uh, later on around consumptive demand, uh, Harkin Angle, and we'll see if we can offer some prizes. But in all seriousness, let me introduce the panel. Um, we're really fortunate to have three very distinguished individuals, both from the public and private um, sector, with a very unique experience and perspectives on this, these issues of of human rights, child labor, and deforestation um, within the context of U.S. trade policy. So to my right, we've got Ann Zollner, who serves as the chief in the Bureau of International Labor Affairs in the U.S. Department of Labor. She represents the Department of Labor in the development, implementation, and enforcement of U.S. trade policy as it relates to bilateral and multilateral trade, including investment issues, and um, the focus is really on improving worker rights around the world. 
Dr. Zollner's worked in the field of international labor and related issues for more than 20 years. Most recently, this work has included an increasing focus on sectors such as fishing, mining, and agriculture. So welcome. Um, to her right is uh, Jennifer McCadney. She is with the law firm uh, Kelly Dreyer. And Jennifer brings over 20 years of experience to the issues that requires delicate balance of legal, political, and regulatory oversight and perspectives. And I think you can all appreciate that what we've been discussing, issues like due diligence, human rights, deforestation, really are at the nexus of those three issues. Um, so we're really pleased to have Jennifer here. She's also worked as a staffer on the Hill, but also worked with companies on issues of sustainability, um, trade uh, enforcement, labor law enforcement, and supply chain monitoring across a variety of sectors. So we're very pleased to have Jennifer here. And last but not least, we have Brian McKeon. He is the Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the National Confectioners Association. And if you don't know the North American perspective, the National Confectioners Association is really the trade association in North America, in the United States, that brings together all of the chocolate, biscuit, and confectioner makers, similar, slightly equivalent to Cowbisco um, here in the EU context. Um, and Brian, prior to that, had worked on political campaigns and um, with several well-known senators, including um, former Senator Barbara Boxer and um, uh, Senator Sheehan. So, Brian, we're really pleased to have you here. And I think even the slideshow alluded to some of the, the new principles that NCA has laid out. So we're looking forward to hearing about that. So what I'd like to do is invite each of the panelists, and I'll begin, Jennifer, with you. If you could just introduce a little bit more of what you do in your work, what your organization does, and then um, come back to this question of how do you see the issues of uh, human rights and uh, deforestation as applicable within the context of U.S. trade policy? We'll, we'll start with Jennifer, and then we'll go to Brian and finish up with Anne. And then I'll ask a few questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm so delighted to be here today. Uh, so my involvement with issues pertaining to cocoa, child labor, forced labor, sustainability, have essentially spanned the, the duration of about you know, two decades. Um, I've worked both in the private sector, as, as Paul uh, indicated, and also um, at, as an attorney advocate. And then I also worked um, as a congressional aide. I was a trade staffer for the Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee many years ago. Um, but in preparing for this panel, it sort of dawned on me that I really have been working on these issues for my entire career. I mean, almost starting from, from almost day one, um, from multiple perspectives, and I have a lot of different vantage points. So I graduated law school, I'm dating myself here in, in 2000, and I joined a firm that at the time was uh, representing uh, the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, um, a predecessor of, of NCA, and also doing work for the Global Issues Group. So I'm throwing out uh, acronyms here, and so you all may be familiar with them. So my introduction to this was really just out of law school, working on the events leading up to and eventually culminating in the Harkin Angle Protocol. Uh, from there, um, I've been involved in litigation, policymaking, legislation, up to the work that I'm doing now, which is providing strategic counsel and advice to a number of companies on supply chain, compliance issues, and a variety of sectors, including cocoa, um, not only with the uh, consumer-facing brands, but also the commodity traders. Uh, so that is the vantage point uh, from which I approached this, and I thought that maybe I would do a little bit of scene setting. I know you heard from uh, the EU side yesterday, and um, I want to thank Alex for putting together the slide because it caught us up really quickly, because uh, I know that everyone's been sort of, you know, waiting with bated breath to hear what's happening in the United States. Um, I have heard uh, in circles uh, uh, a saying that, you know, the United States innovates, and the European Union regulates. I don't want to oversimplify, but that might be sort of an interesting context to look at this. So on the EU side, you have a very broad, comprehensive due diligence strategy that is moving under a mandate, broad in the sense that it covers human rights and it also covers sustainability. What is sustainability? We're talking the environmental issues here, right? Within which it has been designed, I believe, to 
um, complement the specific directives uh, that include um, deforestation and, and labor, forced labor issues. So there is a certainty that these directives will come into force um, and you are working sort of more from a holistic perspective. You are cross horizontal, you're covering everything. In the United States, it is very much inverse. Uh, the elements that we have to deal with these issues are in law, uh, a law that has been in our books since you know, 1930, section 307, which is an import ban. That's, that's where we start. We have proposed legislation um, in the form of the Forest Act, and then we also have agency guidance, and that's the due diligence. Um, we are working backwards, and to be clear, our forced labor deforestation, we are focusing not on the broader human rights elements, it's forced labor and deforestation. Uh, so that's really the, the, the framework. Um, we are going uh, sort of more narrow and siloed, and we are moving in tandem and I think there is yet to be um, a movement to kind of pull all of these elements together. Um, I just want to briefly go through um, each of these laws to give a sense of how, how they work. Section 307, as I mentioned, is an import ban. It prohibits the importation of products made with forced labor in whole or in part. The agency that is authorized to enforce this as U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And they do this by issuing, they conduct investigations, and they issue withhold release orders. And the idea is that the withhold release order should have some level of specificity. The, it should be linked to a product and to a specific producer. But we have seen the law used a little bit more broadly. We have seen, in the case of Palm, orders issued against Syme Darby. We have seen it applied in a regional context with respect to Xinjiang. We have also seen it applied to a countrywide basis with the case of Malawi, tobacco from Malawi. So that creates issues if you are trying to trace and to sort of prove how your product um, is not connected to any of those elements that are identified within the scope. So we have expanded this concept of an import ban through the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. It was passed last year. It just came into force this March. Um, and what the UFLPA does is it, it is an enhancement of our existing law. And it basically deems products from the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region as violative of Section 307, also listed entities. So, it bypasses the investigation and customs directly goes to enforcement. Is the product from Xinjiang, is it from a listed entity? From which point perspective, if the importer is trying to bring their product into the United States, whether there's a withhold release order or it's being detained under the UFLPA, they have to prove with reasonable evidence under 307 or clear and convincing evidence under the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that their product is either not in scope or it is not made with forced labor. So that is the model within which we are working. Um, we are using trade agreements uh, to, we, we, we have had a history of, of addressing uh, you know, labor and environmental issues through our trade agreements. Um, notably, uh, the most recent trade agreement that we concluded, the USMCA, which is our modernized NAFTA, includes a commitment that Mexico and Canada have agreed to implement in their laws a law similar to the United States, Section 307. And Anne will talk a little bit more about the role of labor and environment in our trade policy. So again, still very much focused on that import ban. We are now seeing the import ban being expanded to new sectors. Um, we have had the existing Lacey Act, but the Forest Act, which was introduced uh, by uh, its I think widely viewed as a uh, partisan bill it, with, in, introduced by Democrats, it also has a number of provisions to address commodity-driven deforestation, but the key element of it is an import ban. So again, you see how this is um, developing in the U.S. I know Brian's going to talk a little bit more about about the um, forced labor, the sorry, the Forest Act. Um, and its prospects for it moving in the U.S. Congress, which I will just say are um, looking extremely unlikely in the current um, environment. Which finally brings me to due diligence. Um, and, you know, due diligence is something that uh, companies are expected to do. 
Um, we have this guidance. It comes from the same sources that everyone else has looked at, the OECD, the UN. Our uh, federal agencies have, in, have, in, have incorporated it. The Department of Labor has a comply chain, which has all of those familiar elements, and, and we'll probably talk about that as well. But in the United States, due diligence is something that you are expected to do in order to identify risks in your supply chain, okay? And the due diligence will, at some point, enable you to prove, put evidence forward, should your merchandise uh, be um, targeted under a customs enforcement effort. The UFLPA specifically notes that in order to rebut the presumption, companies have to be able, as a first case basis, to demonstrate that they have implemented due diligence. But here is the wrinkle. Even if a company has implemented due diligence, they're doing the monitoring, they're doing the remediation, they are certifying, they're mapping and tracing, if a product is found to violate Section 307, you still cannot import it. It's prohibited from entry. Um, so, so that is, uh, you know, our due diligence is sort of on the back end, whereas in the EU, they're sort of building it on the front end, it looks like, and then plugging their different specific issue areas into that. And I'll just end on one final point with respect to traceability, because I think that's gonna be something very important to this audience. You may be wondering, why have we been focusing on traceability so long? I mean, for, for, for the deforestation issue, sustainability, but at the outset of Hark and Angle, it became very clear that in order for the cocoa industry to prove you know, what everyone is calling the negative, you will need to know how, where your products are coming from. You will need to prove, depending on what level, you know, if the industry is faced with a withhold release order, that you are not targeted to the farm or the co-op or the region and hopefully not a country level ban. How do you prove that your products are not from there? That is why it has been so important. That is why you've been hearing over and over again, you need to be able to trace the product back to the source. You gotta go to the farm level. And then how, and then it is also important how you're sourcing your beans. You can then see where the, you want to be able to prove that you have a tight chain of custody. And so are your beans commingled, even if you can show that you're not from those sources? Which is why elements like, are you buying it direct? Are you buying it indirect? You immediately see the problems with mass balance. And then you now can understand why segregated supply chains and you know, um, identity preserved is really the gold standard. Um, so I'll stop there and let my other co-panelists jump in. Thank you, Jennifer. I learn it something every time I speak to Jennifer, uh, and I've spoken to her many times. So thank you very much, Brian. Uh, give us, tell us about NCA's work, your principles, and also how you see this issue of, if you will, due diligence within the U.S. trade policy. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, and um, and Jennifer. Thanks for that that great overview. I, I want to say at the at the outset here that. I want to thank WCF for, for inviting us here. Uh, we have a tremendous partnership between my organization and the World Cocoa Foundation. We both sit and live in Washington, D.C. Um, as entities. Um, we are, are honored to, to help WCF um, uh, lobby the Hill um, in, in certain contexts and, and you know, really have a tremendous partnership, particularly uh, on, these, on these issues. Um, you know, Jennifer, maybe I'll, I'll flip your idiom a little bit on, on due diligence with where we, where we are in, in the current context and, and that, you know, Europe is innovating uh, with, with, with what's happening. And, I, and, and frankly, I think, you know, this concept, it, it is becoming coming on, on us as an industry in the United States and I think as well as some other um, commodity industries to try and introduce the concept of due diligence in the United States framework. You know, we have spent a lion's share of, of this year, 2022, um, essentially walking around town, um, going to different agencies and talking about what's happening in the EU, what we think that might potentially look like in the United States context. Um, and, and what we've done, which was, was, was noted on the, on the slide presentation before, is that we've put together two, I, I think, very substantive documents uh, that outline general frameworks for, for due diligence on both the human rights side and on the, on the climate side, um, forest protection side. And what we're trying to do, I think, is, is build on the progress that's being made here in the EU and try and bring those concepts back to the United States in some framework. You know, we, we, are, we are in this situation with Section 307 of the Tariff Act. It, it's in, it's, as Jennifer said, it is in the law. It's not going away in the law. So how do we figure out 
what the next, you know, the, the law was passed almost 100 years ago. Um, and, and, and I would make the argument that there is an opportunity to, to modernize it, um, particularly when we're dealing with global supply chains. So what we're calling for in these documents is pretty straightforward, right? It's harmonization, it's commonality of terms, um, it's commonality of benchmarks. Um, it, it, is, it is aligning, you know, any penalties or, or, you know, the run through the entire regulation. What does that look like in the United States? What does that look like with the existence and the fact that the Section 307 of the Tariff Act is not going away? So how do, we, how do we merge those concepts in a way that makes sense, I think, in our country? You know, we are, you know, continuing, I think, uh, with what's happened in, in, in the last year with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, moving, continued towards, um, strict enforcement on, on certain things, but I, there's also a recognition that I think, as we've gone around the various agencies that have equities uh, in, in dealing with forced labor and child labor and, and deforestation, that there are opportunities to modernize. There are opportunities to find harmonization between the, what the EU is doing and what the United States might, might be doing um, in the future. So I, I want to thank all the Europeans in the room. I think <laughs> we are drafting off, off of your hard work, um, you know. I think they're, they're, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of not reinventing the wheel, uh, and I think there are a lot of things that we're trying, working very hard to bring to the United States. And just, just socializing these ideas, I think it's been something that's been new. I also think it's new for us as, as an industry in the United States to be thought leaders uh, on this. I, a lot of the companies in this room right now um, are pushing us to be more forward-leaning, more active, more aggressive, and trying to get this message out. Um, and what I've picked up over the last couple of days here is there is tremendous progress being made. It's not, it's not solved. These problems are not solved. They're solvable. Um, and I, I feel a lot of momentum. And so I, I do, I do want to thank everybody in the room that, that, that is working on these issues. You know, one, one thing I want to, I want to note that was also mentioned in the slide, in the slide situation is that the cocoa industry in the United States has been under investigation for the last two years by Customs and Border Protection. Um, that process is exceptionally opaque, there's, there's, there's no information shared or very little information shared um, from, you know, CBP is a law enforcement agency. They're not regulators, they're not, you know, they're, they're not putting policy out, it is see something, act. Um, and, and, you know, there, that makes sense in a lot of contexts. I do think that there are contexts where that, that process could be updated and modernized. We're also talking about the need for that. Um, but we, we have been under investigation for the last two years. And I, I think it, while we are hopeful that there will not be stop shipments of cocoa to the United States, be they, you know, you mentioned some of the ways that CBP has done it, company-wide, region-wide, country-wide, that risk is on the table. It, it is. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope I wake up every single day not seeing an email in my inbox that that's the case, but it, that's a legitimate possibility. Um, I, hope it's, I hope it doesn't happen, but, but it's out there. And I think that that has created, you know, an urgency to what we're doing, to what you're doing here and what we, we are hoping to replicate in the United States, that um, we don't want to see economies, um, you know, thrown in, in, into difficulties that, that might result from from um, trade enforcement like this. But we also don't want the reasons for the enforcement to happen to still be there on the ground. So it, it, I, I do feel a real sense of urgency. I feel like there are opportunities here. Jennifer mentioned the Forest Act and it's, it's unlikely um, passage into law anytime soon given the political dynamics in the United States. But what we, what we just saw last week was, I think a recognition from our State Department in the United States that, that there is an opportunity to regulate, similar to the way that, that Europe is, is, is looking to regulate on deforestation and forest uh, protection. Um, our State Department put out a very, very robust uh, request for information on how to stand up a regulatory regime similar to what is being contemplated here in the EU. Uh, they're also asking about pathways through legislation and through changing the statute to do the same thing. I see this as an opportunity to seed the message that enforcement only is not the path forward. That it's got to be all of the above. Um, and I encourage entities in the room to take a look at what the State Department has put out and, and consider um, sharing your messages uh, through that process. That's an open process. Anyone can comment on it. We will be commenting as NCA. Um, it's due December 2nd. So write it down if you're interested in doing it. Don't, don't wait. 
Uh, but I, I feel real mom moment momentum here, uh, and, and I, I feel like, uh, again, thankful that, that the EU is leading here and we're, we're able to draft off all the good work that's happening here. Great. Thank you, Brian. You're a real sort of hill insider, as we would say. So your perspective on some of this legislation and its prospect for passage is really helpful. And you're here representing um, the administration, um, particularly the U.S. Department of Labor. Tell us about your work and your perspective on this question of child labor and worker rights and uh, as applicable deforestation. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to the World Cocoa Foundation for having me. Um, Paul introduced me. I am from a small um, international bureau and a largely domestic agency, this Bureau of International Labor Affairs. And I represent the Office of Trade and Labor Affairs, distinguished from our Office of Child Labor, Forced Labor, and Human Trafficking, um, of I'm sure some of the folks in this room are very familiar with. So um, our, uh, the mission of the Bureau is to promote worker rights and dignity at work at home and abroad. And we do this through a range of different mechanisms. This includes both strengthening and enforcing labor commitments in our trade uh, relationships, as well as technical assistance and programmatic work, and then awareness raising and research, of which forms a, a really significant foundation of our work. Um, a cornerstone, um, this has been referenced already and through the fabulous slideshow um, that was created by WCF, um, of the way that U.S. approaches trade is of in, it's an enforceable and binding commitments that we put on our country trade relationship partner, I'm sorry, country partner government relationships. So that is a real cornerstone of the way that we approach our trade and slightly distinguished from the way the EU does it. Um, although acknowledging that with the new TSD introduced in June, there, there's some movement in that direction. So, um, and we do all of this um, with the idea, and I think it goes back to the way the ILO was formed, the International Labor Organization, that we do this because we believe that it creates inclusive economic growth. We have seen trade investment where the wealth accrues to people um, in elite positions or resource sort of rich positions, but we want to make sure that trade and investment accrues to people across the spectrum, including the workers who undergird the economies. Um, I, I should say that uh, this is particularly true at this moment with our Biden worker-centered trade policy, which is a, a very nice, I feel like my office has been worker, doing worker-centered <laughs> trade policy forever, but now it's being done across um, the spectrum of USG agencies, and it's really being done with the a mindset that uh, a fair trading system should uphold the rules, uh, not have... Um, labor rights undermined, pit workers against each other, and it shouldn't z be a zero-sum game. And one of the things that's really being hit in this space is the notion of worker voice, and that we should be including workers as eyes and ears, uh, uh, and the folks closest to the practices that we're concerned about. So one of the ways that we see to mitigate forced and child labor is by increasing freedom of association and the right to collective bargain. And so that is something that's being particularly sort of focused on by my administration at the Bureau of International Labor Affairs. I'll just make reference to the way that we handle our free trade agreements. We ask um, in our free trade, trade agreements, countries are required to adopt and maintain in law and practice the internationally recognized worker rights that are based on the fundamental principles and rights of the ILO. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Yes. So, um, and um, that's really critical. These are, like I said, enforceable binding commitments. And in our trade preference programs, including our generalized system of preferences, which is a unilateral trade preference pro, pro, uh, uh, arrangement, um, countries are required to take steps. So it's more of an incremental recognition that countries in that situation are developing. And so there's more latitude there. Um, we, uh, the, I think that it's important to note that we approach the compliance aspect of our trade preference programs, and that's worth, I mean, worth noting that these are some of the country governments um, in this space, uh, that we do that in conjunction with the interagency and our U.S. Trade Representative's Office, who is, uh, sort of runs that process. But we do that, and we look at country compliance, and we also look at products. Uh, uh, in fact, um, to make sure that workers in the supply chain of particular products 
are afforded the full internationally recognized worker rights. And that's worth noting that while cocoa beans are uh, duty free, have duty free access to the US market, that some uh, derivative products, cocoa, because we do think there's a real benefit to having value added processing in countries, do come in under GSP. So we want to make sure that all those products are also sort of recognizing the rights that allow con the countries to have duty free access. It's our approach. Oh, I, I should just also make mention of the fact that we have our African Growth and Opportunity Act, which sits on top of our general system of preferences, and we also participate in those review processes. Um, in all of that work, our preferred mode is to um, encourage country compliance, where we see concerns uh, and where violations are brought to us by third party stakeholders. We work very hard. And whether it's initiating a formal review with a country, we work very hard and have worked with countries for years and years to make sure they are meeting that taking step requirement. It is always our last resort to have to take the hard consequence of withdrawing trade preferences. And we've had to do it, and I will make mention of the fact that uh, GSP is still withdrawn for um, Bangladesh. Um, so that is unfortunate, but we, we do have to act when we have um, sort of sort of exhausted all the things we can do. And so we do that engagement through a variety of different means. I reference programs and research. Our child labor office in particular uh, really takes a lot of prevalent, they do a lot of research and prevalence surveys in West Africa. They create lists. They have their Trade and Development Act report, which ranks countries on where, and provides recommendations to countries on how they should be approaching change in these areas. And I, I just, I, I'd also note that we um, have 20, 20 million dollars in programming um, across five sectors in both Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So our commitment is there on the ground as well. So that's very positive. And that we are continuing efforts with um, the child labor, or the child labor, Coco, oh my gosh, CLCGCG. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a very um, strong relationship that we've reinvigorated this year and are really looking to bring more diverse stakeholders and partners to that effort and to hold each other accountable, honestly. So um, I'll, I'm probably, my time is sort of running short, sure. but I will uh, make mention of our perspectives on due diligence, or should I go over to you, Paul? We, why don't we uh, take a few questions? Okay. We actually only have about 10 minutes remaining, oh, and they're very strict, and I know people have other things, including travel, they need to get to, so I don't want to impose in your time. But, Ann, I'm going to come back to you on some of these, these opportunities and tools that you reference. Brian, you've, I've heard you speak several times about sort of creating a big tent. How do we, how do we bring the right people in the room to make sure we can talk about modernizing U.S. trade policy and ideally harmonizing it uh, with the EU market. Because after all, many of the companies operate on both sides of the Atlantic. So could you talk a little bit about your, your thoughts and perspectives on that and what the opportunity is? Yeah, well, and I'll give Department of Labor credit for that that notion. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, I first, first heard that in, in meetings we did earlier this year with DOL. Um, the notion of creating the room, and, I, and we've had similar conversations with, with, with folks out here as well um, over the last year and, and, and here in Brussels this week about getting that room together. Um, back to my earlier point, you know, these are solvable, solvable problems. It's, it, it, there are hard decisions that have to be made, um, but there is momentum um, on, on, on this, and I, I feel like what Ann mentioned, you know, the Biden administration is truly focused on this. You know, the, the U.S. Trade Re Representative, um, who's, who's not here this week, they are laser focused on a whole of government approach to addressing forced labor. That's an opportunity. It, it, it is. Yeah. We're hearing the phrases due diligence, due care being used in regulatory filings. The State Department um, document I mentioned earlier uses those phrases. That's, that's new in the United States. We're seeing that pop up more and more, um, which I, again is an opportunity, I think, for, for industry to step in and encourage, offer solutions that are well-intentioned and well-meaning, and, and our members are all on board with, with, with that idea. Great. 
Thank you, Brian. And if anyone's interested in learning more about particularly that State Department request for information, I'm sure Brian would be happy to share some information. It's also available, obviously, on the State Department's website. Jennifer, um, I'm going to ask you a difficult question to, to look into the future. If you were to write the next two or three slides for our lovely slide presentation that really brought us up to date, what would be on those slides? What do you think this group, this industry, needs to be focused on when it comes to the future of U.S. trade legislation? I know it's a little bit crystal ball gazing and totally unfair, but I'll ask the question anyway. There are so many things that I hope would be done, and maybe I'll focus on something granular, and it could be very sort of high hopes, but, you know, the concept of an import ban is clearly embedded in U.S. law, and the Europeans are looking at that, not import, but commodity-wide. Um, it is an important tool. Import bans are, are very strong tools. If you're going to use, you know, our, our USTR has said that we're going to use every tool in the toolbox. Bans are strict liability, very rigid. I believe these are tools that should be used in certain circumstances. I am not opposed to using these tools, but you need to understand how they work. And, and what, what, what do I mean by that? Um, if you are going to impose a ban for forced labor or for uh, environmental degradation, um, and if we're going to keep using these tools, we need to understand they need to be used correctly in the right situation. So it's really important to understand what is the underlying condition that you are trying to resolve. Import bans are really good at getting attention. They are effective at getting people who, have, who are in a position of authority to make the change. They are also very good at disrupting supply chains. And it is unclear at this point how good they are at, underlying, at addressing those underlying causes. So when you're looking at the underlying causes of forced labor or environmental degradation, is it state-sponsored? Is it a government that is imprisoning people and making them work against their will where no amount of engagement will resolve that situation? I would argue that an import ban is something that you want people to get out of there. There's no opportunity to remediate similarly in the environmental space. But if the underlying indicators are poverty related, you have a different set of circumstances. And I would argue that the authorizers, the, the administrators, the customs agencies who are implementing these operationally need to have flexibility to use them. And what has become crystal clear to me um, in listening to all of these conversations is that, you know, the, the, the the status on the ground is very important, and it could differ from industry to country to sector. And if, and I hope, there is not a countrywide ban applied to Ghana or Ivory Coast, when you look at, the, at the, all of the elements in the supply chain and who is in the, you know, in, in the situation to be at most risk and to have the least leverage and who will probably be the impact, who will be impacted the most, and that's the farmer. And so I hope that, you know, that is recognized by, you know, all of the stakeholders um, because modifying 307 needs to be done. And I think everyone needs to recognize that you don't want it to have unintended consequences. You want to make sure that it is helping the people and not hurting, and not hurting them. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Anne, um, we may only have time for one question, maybe two, but what I'd like to ask you is, you know, you've been here with this cocoa sector now for two days, listening to some very interesting discussions and unique perspectives um, from the European Union, if you will. What, what key lessons are you going to take back to the United States? You talked about a whole of government, um, Biden administration approach to child labor. What issues do you take back from this discussion over the last two days that you'd like to bring into the context of, of that policy work? Mm -hmm. that's, that's helpful. It's, it, it sort of expands a conversation that um, we've been having already. We have the same values, right, the EU and the US. We have the same values and we have the same priorities and the same issues are on our radar. How we approach them is slightly different, but I think there are best practices from both sides that can be drawn from. I'm, I continue to come to what Jennifer was just referencing. The, most, the least powerful, most risky people aren't in these conversations, and they're the ones who will be impacted if there is something blunt under 
take it. So um, I, I do feel like we do need to continue a conversation and we in fact have um, what's called a trade and labor dialogue ongoing with the EU which will bring a variety of stakeholders together and we'll be meeting I think in the next six months or so. So that'll be important to continue that conversation. I'm going to take back to my office um, what I've heard from my EU colleagues over lunch, the, the prioritization of the due diligence from their perspective. We do have some tools in place. We have something called, Jennifer referenced, the Comply Chain, which is a step-by-step step app um, on the essential elements from our perspective of what makes a responsible uh, social compliance system. And I just think, you know, we're looking at the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, and I think that is a clear articulation of the direction this administration is going, even though it's specific to China. Um, we, in our recent uh, list of goods from 2022, are now listing derivative products made um, um, with uh, inputs of child labor and forced labor. So it was only done on a pest pilot test space at this year, but included um, palm oil from palm in Indonesia. So that's the future, is what I was going to say. Like we're we're getting more specific and we're getting more granular. Great, thank you. Brian, do you have any final remarks that you'd like to share with this group, especially in terms of um, maybe lessons from the United States that you think the EU should take under consideration? Um, you know, I, 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 I think what I'd like to leave the group with is, is that we, we, are, we are working on trying to provide more clarity in the United States context. Um, you know, what the cocoa industry has, has the CBP investigation over the last two years, there, there should be flexibility there. Um, there should be opportunities to cure off ramps in that process. The, the, the tool is too blunt. It's not specific enough. Um, so we're, we're going to continue to work on, on, on those solutions and pushing our government to adopt them in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and I truly do think that what's happening over here is helping inform um, how, we, how the, this next, the next phase of, of this issue gets addressed. Great. Thank you. Please join me in thanking this panel for a very informative discussion. Thank you. That already did a pretty good job. Brian, I think you can stay uh, right where you were if you... <laughs> but I would invite the final group of panelists to, in a way, continue this debate. You know, we're starting in Brussels, what has been going on at this conference, what has been going on in Brussels, and then see how do we take this conversation home in the most literal sense that we can. Um, I'm waiting for the panelists to join me. I will introduce you once you get on stage, so please come and join me first. Um, yeah, please come. And if we can give them a warm welcome, as we are one to do at this WCF partnership meeting, yes. <laughs> Chris, maybe if you take this one, Mariam, if I can invite you in this one. Wherever you feel most comfortable, Elvin. Everything else is up for grabs. Aldo, please. So you will see some familiar faces and you will see some slightly less familiar faces. I will introduce the new, Paul, please. Uh, I will introduce the, the new faces. Um, all the way in the corner, we now know Brian very well. Then after that is Paul Davis of the European Cocoa Association. Paul, we haven't seen you yet. Welcome. Then Aldo Cristiano of Caubisco, also a new one in terms of being on stage. Elvin Lee, for you, this is one of many firsts. Your organization, the Cocoa Association Asia, is invited for the first time. And here you are on stage to share what that was like. Thank you for being here. Of course, nobody's more familiar than Chris Vincent at this stage. And Madame Mariam was here with us in a way opening the conference, and here you are, in a way, setting us up for closing the conference. So I'm definitely going to start with you, also with the prospect that you will leave us in about 15 minutes or so. 
um, where I will make clear to the audience that this is not yet another boycott, but this is actually Madame Mariam who has to make her flight. So there's a very significant difference there that I hope you're all aware of. Um, you will then leave us with the unfortunate prospect of the final picture on the stage being with six gentlemen in dark suits. But while you are here, Madame Mariam, we are, for many reasons, delighted to have you. Um, so let's go back to, again, you know, almost, almost the opening words of the conference. Um, you said you were happy to be here. You're not a cocoa expert. You are by now. You spent uh, two days in our midst, and I've seen you in this room all the time. So you are somewhat of a cocoa expert. But can I ask you specifically with the regard, you said you were here to hold up a mirror. Now if you, in a way, sort of explain to us what you have seen in the Coco mirror, what was that? What struck you this conference? And if I can ask you one thing, what surprised you this conference? Uh, merci beaucoup. Je vais préférer parler en, en français. C'est plus facile. Alors, euh, oui, j'ai passé deux jours, deux jours agréables. J'ai trouvé que cette conférence était une très belle plateforme pour apprendre. J'ai beaucoup appris. Je ne suis pas encore une experte, mais j'ai beaucoup appris. Et euh, ce que j'ai retenu, c'est d'abord que c'est une industrie qui est globale. Elle est globale. Même si l'Afrique de l'Ouest pèse 60%, c'est une industrie qui est globale. Et je pense que c'est important de, de le savoir. J'ai vu des, des visages de, de partout dans le monde. La deuxième des choses que j'ai retenues, si vous le permettez, j'ai vu trois forces en présence. J'ai vu... Il y a une qui n'était pas là. <rire> j'ai vu la force des compagnies du secteur privé. J'ai vu la force de la société civile. J'ai entendu, mais je n'ai pas perçu la, la force des gouvernements. Et j'ai noté que c'était trois forces qui avaient des logiques un peu différentes. Et je me dis, euh, peut-être que il faudrait penser à trouver, euh, comment je peux dire ça, à rapprocher ces logiques différentes pour trouver une logique euh, qui va permettre de faire avancer un peu le... Qui va, qui va permettre de faire avancer et de faire les changements qu'il faut au niveau de... au niveau de l'industrie, hein, du, du secteur du, du cacao. Donc voici un peu ce que j'ai retenu. J'ai appris beaucoup... Et j'ai vu que, à part la société civile, on a évité de parler du prix. Mmh. Quand j'ai écouté, il n'y a que la société civile qui a parlé du prix. Mais euh, les autres personnes n'ont parlé du prix. Et je me pose la question, pourquoi Ça, c'est une question que je me pose. Et de plus... Euh, j'ai vu que tout le monde se focalisait sur la productivité. Mais ce que j'ai appris, notamment dans le panel sur les prix, c'est que la productivité n'avait pas d'incidence sur euh, le revenu du paysan. Par contre, que le prix avait une incidence sur le revenu du paysan. Alors, si on est tous d'accord, qu'on fait tous ces efforts-là, pour améliorer la vie du paysan, pourquoi on évite de parler du prix C'est une question que je me pose. Je ne suis pas du secteur. C'est une question que je me pose en tant que société civile et en tant que quelqu'un qui regarde un peu, un peu de l'extérieur. Donc c'est un peu cette dynamique-là que j'ai vue, mais je trouve que c'est une excellente plateforme de discussion. Et maintenant, je me pose la question et après. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so that is interesting. So you lay out for us, maybe not all of you were able to, to grab a hold of a translation device. And by the way, if you did get a translation device and you do not return it before leaving this room, there will be very severe consequences. I don't know if you have met the organizing committee, but they are ruthless and they will deal with it <laughs> sufficiently. So do not leave this room before getting rid of your translation device. Now, having said that, 
Uh, Madame Mariam, you kindly lay out sort of the, the three forces that you saw in this conference, right? There's the force, and I like that word, it works in French and I think it works in English, of the private sector, of civil society, and of the government. Although that one is perhaps a bit handicapped. Uh, one more thing. Ah. The producers. The producers, which because was not there. We can right. consider ourselves like consumers, but that was the first question I asked, where are the producers? Right. I couldn't see them. They were very scarce. No, that's very true. Um, they were here, so it's not like they were absent. I, I would like to highlight that in several of my panels they were sitting in. Um, of course, we had many more in mind, um, but they were not here because they were not allowed to be here. So that's, uh, that, that is really the reality that we had to face at this conference. Um, unfortunate as it is, but I think your, your point still is, is very valid that in a way these three forces that you describe have a very different logic. And I think the point that you raise, or I spent a bit of time setting up this question is, in their logic, I think many people think that we talked about price quite a bit. And I know there are also many people who think in their logic that we haven't talked about price at all. And clearly you fall into that category. And that's sort of really, really how how I think you framed that question. So I would like to ask uh, the panelists, maybe I start with you, Aldo, because we haven't heard you on stage yet. Um, do you feel like we've talked about price or do you feel like we haven't talked about price in your logic? Well, we have talked a lot about prices the past two days and uh, I think it's wrong to say that we should not talk about price, but we, I think yesterday Pam did a very well uh, thoughtful uh, comment on what are the market dynamics and to understand how the market is functioning. And in light of understanding how the market is functioning, you need to get right solutions in order to tackle what we would like to achieve. If you are not understanding well that and the consequences, then you might never end up where we would like. I think we have, the whole room here, the same vision for a thriving cocoa supply chain. And we would love to have no child labor, no deforestation, and obviously a living income for each and every farmer. And I think all the companies which are heavily engaged, and we have been seeing throughout the past two days, senior representatives of companies which have once again said with their program they want to contribute to make a thriving supply chain. Obviously, we are not there yet, and I think such a venue like today and the venue we've seen in Rome uh, a couple of weeks ago is again, <coughs> let's say, a way in sharing, learning, and obviously bringing into the programs of the single companies which have been since many years working hard and giving resources into their way of moving forward. And I think we have done also progress. We are not at the end, but I think we have done progress and we need now to understand better how to get into different areas. I mean, the price, obviously, and that was your question, is one of the areas. We might have time to talk about other areas where we had great success. We've seen today on the CFI how an idea came into life and where we are today and how we will move forward. And I think we should recognize and acknowledge the work that has been done. Again, it's not perfect. We have to tackle, we have to talk, but I think, and that's the key message, we need to understand the market mechanism in order to make the right decision. We have been seeing that if you do a wrong decision, where it ends up. Madame Mayom, I will ask the final question because then I think you will have to leave us. So we have a, a minute or two. Um, so you, you, you've heard this, and perhaps I can then ask you, do you feel that you've understood the logic, like you are from the world of civil society, although it's a bit confusing because you're also a banker, so it's not like you don't understand markets, and you are also a politician, so in a way you also understand government. <laughs> Yet I ask this question to you, as a member of civil society, do you feel like you understand the logic of the private sector, and I specifically mean these cocoa companies, do you feel like you understand it a bit better? What has changed in your perspective? Je, je crois que je comprends la logique du marché, euh, qui est une logique, euh, je dirais, habituelle. C'est une logique pour, euh, pour toutes les commodités. Ce que j'essaie de faire, 
et que j'ai pris l'habitude de faire, c'est soit pas de changer la logique, d'y apporter un autre paramètre qui va lui permettre d'être un peu plus équitable. Mm -hmm. euh, parce que dans sa logique, le marché n'est pas forcément équitable. Équitable par rapport à qui En général, quelle que soit la commodité, par rapport au producteur. Et si on veut parler de, 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 de commerce équitable ou de d'un peu de justice dans, dans, dans une logique de marché, c'est ça qu'il faut introduire pour que le marché soit plus équitable et qu'on arrive à un prix, si j'ose appeler, juste. Donc je comprends bien la logique du marché, je comprends ses imperfections, je comprends son impact sur le producteur et je me dis, il y a quelque chose qui peut être fait pour éviter qu'on en arrive, je veux dire, à la catastrophe. Mais c'est une logique qui marche pour euh, l'ensemble des commodités. Hein. Ça va être le sucre, ça va être le palmier à huile. C'est la logique du marché, du marché au vert, je le comprends très bien. Excellent, thank you. So the logic you're saying is not, you understand the logic, but within that logic you want to change the parameters and you oui. want to change the et, et je voudrais revenir encore à mon intervention de la première journée. Je pense qu'il y a des moments où il faut oser oser faire autrement, oser peut-être changer. Si on n'ose pas, on ne peut pas forcément apporter des, soit des logiques différentes, soit euh, des méthodes différentes. Et je pense qu'ici, et je le reconnais, euh, le secteur va rentrer dans une crise, elle va être dommageable à plusieurs niveaux, aux paysans, au gouvernement, ou même aux organisations de la société civile et peut-être en dernier ressort aux, aux sociétés commerciales. Mais la crise est là, je pense qu'il va falloir la résoudre et pour la résoudre, on ne peut pas rester dans la même logique parce qu'on rentre dans une logique de crise et dans la logique de crise, il faut avoir un souci de... de je l'appelle comme ça entre guillemets, de, de bienveillance tout en préservant je veux dire ses, ses, propres, ses propres intérêts. Donc, ce que je note, c'est que le secteur va rentrer dans une crise. Et la crise, elle est là, on la voit partout. On la voit avec euh, la Russie, on la voit euh, en Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, avec les différents euh, coups d'État qui se succèdent. On la voit dans plusieurs secteurs et on la voit venir aussi dans le secteur du cacao. Alors, il ne faut pas attendre. Il faut peut-être prendre le taureau par les cornes. Et puis, euh, voilà. Excellent. atténuer les effets de la crise. Voilà. Merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Ça a été deux belles journées. Je ne suis pas encore une experte, mais j'ai beaucoup appris. Et merci à WCF de m'avoir invité. Merci à tous. Et euh, bonne chance à tout le monde. Merci so much. Well, then, after this wonderful uh, mic drop intervention, as we say. <laughs> There's a crisis. I think Madame Mariam did a good job of highlighting that and, and setting us off on the right sense of urgency. Um, throughout this conference, different instruments have been introduced to do something about that crisis. Um, since we are here in Brussels, Um, I think I'd like to start with the famous, now famous, and now you are all very educated on this, the EU due diligence procedures that are up and coming. We've heard it described from different angles. But first, I want to bring some clarity, because I noticed that, as is the case with EU representatives or European Commission representatives, their interventions can often lead to confusion. So, and it already, when we were sort of practicing a little bit for the panel, there was some missing, <laughs> well, there were different interpretations on what was actually said. Um, actually, although I'm going to start with you with also this one, so because I understood the best what you were saying when we were having the previous discussion. So if you could very clearly and shortly for us summarize, what were you think the main points that the commissioner made? And we'll focus on the commissioner intervention. So I think that I think the confusion came when um, uh, Ryan does said that uh, we have another five years for deforestation free uh, products coming into Europe. Uh, I think he made a mistake. I don't know what you have uh, been interpreting, but 
I think he meant the due diligence, the corporate sustainable due diligence from when it will be finally decided, voted, and then the time into getting enforcement and then reporting and complying with that, right? But uh, um, the deforestation is uh, on the table. Um, this uh, regulation will be coming soon. And uh, that's why we had a lot of discussion also about traceability. And we might later have, again, the chance to go a bit deeper. We have heard today from the US, obviously, how much they would love to have a serious um, a traceability system. And I always said in the past, you know, getting really a truly sustainable supply chain you can't have not a serious traceable system Excellent. up on the ground. We'll, we'll get to that for sure. Uh, but Paul, you are somebody who understands Brussels perhaps like no other in this room. What did you make of the speech of the commissioner? And if you want, you can also bring in the uh, vice president of the parliament and her contribution. Was there something new in those words for you that surprised you? Or is it what a word? Working. Um, it's, uh, no, I think the EU is being extremely clear um, for a long period of time. I think, the, I think some of the processes of legislation in, in the European Union, I think I'm permitted to say, can be time, time, take a long time and can be a little confusing. But the timetable, I think, is pretty clear. Um, we're coming, I think the EU is coming at the problems facing imports into the European Union at, from various different angles. But certainly the environmental issue is very, very strong uh, in this continent and is incredibly serious. Uh, the the uh, forum we just had in Rome at the ECA, we couldn't have been clearer. Um, it's consumer led, it's, uh, it's accepted by everybody and there is no stopping that train at all. Um, that legislation will come in, I think probably we expect in February, March. Um, it comes into effect enforcement uh, after two years, but the cutoff date uh, for a deforestation free import has already gone. Uh, that is likely to be 2020. And I don't want to anticipate uh, what, the, uh, what the final legislation will say, because I'm not a legislator, but I'm pretty convinced that this is where it's going to land. Um, so, no, the EU has been extremely clear. Um, I think coming through to um, due diligence, there's still a lot of discussion. There's a process you know, to be finished. Um, we're expecting legislation probably around the end, about, about 12 months' time. Uh, it may take a little longer. It may take, you know, who knows? But it'll, about a year. And again, the, the enforcement date will probably be about 24 months after that. So I think that's where if there was any confusion. Um, how Excellent. that lands, Thank you. it can't be as specific. Excellent. So well, that's very clear. Thank you for... Um, getting us to that point. So now if we think a little bit through the implications of that, how we will deal with that. Elvin, you are decidedly uh, not from Europe, you are from Asia, but how, and we've heard from the American perspective, Brian, sort of how you, uh, you, I think, very eloquently brought the two together already. Could you share with us similarly, Elvin, how do you see the implications of this uh, EU due diligence system? Do you think in Asia, in your area, there will be an impact? And if so, in what way? Yeah, so, you know, I think one thing when, when we talk about Asia, it's very important to uh, remember Asia is not one country. It is uh, also not uh, one uh, organized uh, economic union. So, you know, to get things, you know, first uh, uh, manifested as an idea and then subsequently into, into implementation, yeah, that takes uh, a lot. It's, it's a multi-governmental effort and then you, you add the private sector mess to it all. So that's, that's the first challenge, I think. Um, I think the fact that you know, the CAA, a co association of Asia, is here for the first time um, ever um, as a formal sort of uh, participant on, on, on a WCF meeting also shows how far we have to go in terms of uh, global communication, right? I think, um, obviously, we're very honoured to be here. We're very glad the, the call came from uh, uh, Chris's uh, team at the WCF. But, you know, Asia is today responsible for over a million tonnes of cocoa bean processing. That is that is uh, easily 20-plus uh, percent of global production, right? And, you know, we clearly still have a mismatch in flows. And out of, out of all the wonderful product that gets made, you know, while a lot of the, uh, what we say, the cocoa powder is captured in, in, in Asia, uh, much of the cocoa butter actually flows back uh, here to the EU or to the US. 
uh, in the tens of thousands of tons to create hundreds of thousands of tons of, of chocolate. So the, the, the question also, I guess, to come back to, 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 to where you were trying to guide this is, you know, when all this legislation goes in, in place, you know, have we fully considered, you know, what the agents need to do in order to get up to pace to be able to comply, right? And if you, if you do a scenario analysis, as we often like to do in the private sector, like in Gargill, uh, you know, you, will, you, you have to drop a scenario analysis of, okay, what kind of supply chain disruptions are we prepared to endure if, if, mm -hmm. if it is difficult to implement in, uh, in the Asian factories that, you know, are arguably the engine room of a lot of the chocolate industry in, in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, thank you. So let's let's build a little bit. So we've heard some of the implications sort of mentioned. We've heard traceability mentioned. We've heard you know the the risk of severe disruptions in the market and how you could potentially deal with that. Um, let's maybe focus first on as we implement this. Time and time again, it was mentioned that the partnership with the governments is absolutely key, and knowing that the partnership with the governments at this moment is not ideal, shall we say, certainly not with some of the governments. Chris, if I can turn to you with this easy question and ask you, how are we going to go about improving that? Yep. Um, You've got two days to think about <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, I, I need a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> so fir firstly, you're absolutely right. It, it is critical, and, and you'll have picked up on that at so many points, whether it's CFI, whether it's programs we've run in the past, uh, that we really don't make progress without them. Uh, and in certainly what we're trying to do in terms of collaborative programs, the systemic element, the enabling environment is key. So we all know that. Uh, and we have the living income price issue um, outstanding at the moment. Um, you know, I think the first thing that we, we need to engage with is, you know, I think the economic pack discussions are front and center. Um, we were talking earlier about the EU and the COCO Action Talks, you know, those are largely on hold um, pending, you know, where the uh, economic pact discussions want to go. So those are key. So um, I think, you know, at, at this stage, we, we need to sort of walk away from here, react, you know, calm down, react, uh, digest news, make contact again and, and, and restart those partnerships and those conversations. Uh, but I think going forward, it is key in certainly the two key countries uh, in West Africa uh, that we need to broaden and deepen our relationships. Uh, we need to focus on that. Um, it's absolutely critical. Uh, you know, obviously, I can't pretend they're in good shape right now, um, but clearly it's something we've got to work on and continue to work on, and it will always be a priority. Excellent, thank you. So clearly Chris needs all the help he can get on this one. Um, so if we can start on the panel, are there any suggestions that you think you know, could improve the relationship with the governments? Paul. Um, look, I, I think uh, the relationships with particularly the Ivory Coast and Ghanaian government is actually very good, but there's, this is an extremely stressful time. Um, I think the argument that they, I don't, I don't want to speak for them because that would be an insult to them. But the point that they've consistently made, and they have been utterly consistent about it, is price. And I think you know, it's something we've got to listen to. You know, it's, it's a real obligation on all of us to make sure that what we deliver as consumers and politicians and uh, legislators and whatever, is that we don't end up with a situation where consumers are paying a super high price and farmers are getting absolutely killed on the other end of it because they either can't conform or their environment is that it becomes illogical. That I think was the point Marion was trying to make. And I think it's the point we have to, we really do believe in. There isn't anything new about this. It's a, it's a problem um, that we've got to face. And what we've got to make sure of is that the implementation of the goals that we're trying to achieve, which are extremely important for confidence from consumers and, from, and for just building this brilliant market, which is what it is. You know, employing millions and millions and millions of people around the world, is that it, you know, we do so in a way that's super effective, you know, that they get the benefit. They're the ones who've got to get it, so we've got to be efficient in how that's done. That's, that's I think, the point. And I think that's the point they're making. So I okay. keep that in mind, we're all going to win. Okay, that's noted. Brian, um, so often this feels to me, but that's also maybe because I'm European, like a, like a dialogue between West Africa and, uh, and Europe, 
um, I don't see the US government so much in that space. So maybe that's wrong, and then you should tell me. And if that is indeed the case, do you see a role there for the, for the US? So can they broker a kind of partnership that might be hard for the EU for various reasons? I, I do. Um, you know, we, we, there's, a, there, there's a, uh, an African Leaders Summit that's coming up in Washington, D.C. in December. Um, we as NCA have, have been encouraging uh, DOL and state and others to use that as an opportunity um, with the convening authority that, that goes along with that to, to identify some solutions, whether through diplomacy or funding otherwise, that help support some of the goals that, that we're all talking about here. Um, it, it would be unfortunate if, if, if that opportunity came and went without something coming from, from that that's, that's concrete. I, I see it as an opportunity, and we, and we, have, you know, we, have, we have shared ideas um, into the State Department about, about you know, what, what they could do. There's a lot of focus right now, both from a national security, or international security perspective and an economic development perspective with the Biden administration on West Africa. Um, there are lots of programs that are that are being implemented uh, there that, you know, I think you could argue some are concurrent, some are maybe not uh, with what industry is doing, some are maybe not, not necessarily working hand in hand with industry. And I think that's another opportunity to not duplicate um, existing public-private partnerships that are already on the ground, like Cocoa Forest, and Cocoa Forest Initiative, things like that. Leveraging what's already working right now is what we're, we're encouraging our government to do as they're trying to get more and more involved uh, on these matters. Excellent, thank you. Is Chris invited already to the African Leadership Panel, or is that not? No, not yet. You might want to get in on that one. Um, You're always welcome, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running it. <laughs> Um, so, so that's okay. So that's on the government partnerships. Another one <laughs> that we've heard come through a lot is what, okay. What are the implications in the supply chain? And although you've already set us up on, on traceability to some extent, so maybe you can continue a bit because again, also there, I think there's a lot of space for confusion. We've heard, you know, the, the death of mass balance being announced, something that is still the majority of the market. We've seen identity preserved, which now supposedly would apply to all the entire market, that is a huge transition that I don't think is perhaps even realistic. No, I'm setting you up slightly, but maybe you can elaborate on that and see, uh, share with us how you see that evolve. Yeah, thank you. Personally, I've always been a great supporter of a IP or a segregated model because I always thought that not knowing that the US and in Europe in the old days, in the old days, I mean 20 years ago when I started to uh, come to the first uh, WCF meetings, is that you need a starting point, a serious starting point, to understand how cocoa has been obtained. What I mean with obtained is how it has been produced, how it has been, you know, delivered, and what has been the circumstances. And if you have a serious on-the-ground traceability system back to the farm, it is the starting point to understand, really, how that been quality-wise and the circumstances around has been produced, and the starting point where every program can have an impact if you do it rightly, understand it. Because what we always forget is that every household might be different and have different needs. And if you have a traceability system, you know where to start to collect the information, not just purely if that bean has been in a deforestated area and it has not been now allowed to come into Europe or into the US in future, but also to understand what the family is all about, what are their needs, how are the so social circumstances, and where you can leverage and make a change and an impact. So that's why I think that the way towards an IP system is the way in understanding, but also in defending if suddenly the beans, the containers are accused to be not in compliance with regulation laws and expectation and so on. So I think it's also a positive moment. And we've heard yesterday from Pam that half of the cocoa end up in branded products. Mm -hmm. The other half is around the world somewhere ending up where maybe there is no attention to what we are. So it means that the ones which have a, a, a very good traceability system can also defend from being, you know, illegal or not being compliance and so on. That's obviously. 
What is obviously missing in all of this is, like in other commodities in Europe, whether it's the milk sector or whether it's many other commodities, that ideally you should have a national traceability system. Today, companies have started many years ago to do their own traceability system. Sometimes these systems are not speaking to each other. And Chris, you know, on the CFI, we are trying now to put all these things together in order to understand and to map well where industry collectively is, the ones which are part of CFI or the ones which are part of putting together traceability. And I think with Paul, or in, it was still with, uh, uh, with Harold at ECA, we offered to bring, and that obviously always in the light of the legal, let's say, uh, compliances, to offer what we have collected to share with the national future traceability system. Okay? Got it. And that so is also the starting point at the end, just to conclude. When a shipment, or when a vessel, or when a, a container is leaving the country, that you have a certificate, whatever type of verification, which leads then, or which is going with the container into Europe, into the US, or wherever, where you can prove with a verification or a whatever type of bullet verification, whatever you call it, that that cocoa has been deforestation free, child labor free, whatever will be the, in the context of a due diligence regulation for the future. So it's also a unique opportunity to get things rightly done. Okay, so it's many things you point out. It's, it's in a way, it's your first line of defense. It's not just an accountability mechanism, it's also how you can find problems, how you can defend yourself against accusations of problems. It's a programmatic instrument, it's a targeting instrument. So it's many, many different things. So thank you for, for drawing that out slightly broader. Um, but getting there, and you point out the challenges of a national traceability system, are, are quite something. So I'm, I'm still convinced. Elvin, do you think we have seen, the, or we will see anytime soon, the death of mass balance? I mean, I think the 50% the is, uh, the balance 50% is actually a big part of what, you know, um, happens in, in, in Asia. You have, you have obviously the, the, the thriving multinational brands, but then you have, you know, um, the likes of uh, Indo Foods or URC in the Philippines. And these are mega conglomerates that sit, you know, in the not so uh, tiny continent of Asia that, you know, for, for not which... Not just one country. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, also me it's also a big place. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's just, just, <laughs> just a small amount of people in, in this continent. Um, but, you know, if I take the... It, again, right, this is a point that I raised uh, also in Cargill. Sometimes I'm not very popular for it. But it is also, the, the, it is also not the question of are we willing to pay for it, right? It's also the question of are we able to pay for it? Mm -hmm. and, and I give a very simple example. In, in Indonesia, for example, we have... Um, uh, the roadside uh, stall concept, and not chocolate because there's no cold chain, but uh, um, uh, powdered beverages are sold in little uh, 10 gram or, or 15 gram uh, sachets. They cost a uh, thousand rupiah, which is less than uh, 10, uh, 10, which is less than 10 cents. And you know, sometimes the argument is that yeah, you know, sustainability. If you spread it out uh, across you know all the products that you run, it, it just adds like uh, a cent or, or two to a product. But the empathy to understand that, you know, in many of the developing nations, like Indonesia, for example, that first taste of cocoa comes in the form of, you know, a, 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 a small 10 cent pack whose sanctity and economic uh, proposition is broken. The moment the price goes to 11 cents, ah, that is a, that is a problem because the currency comes in uh, just a, a thousand mm -hmm. rupiah. So, you know, and, and it's also the margin that, that many of these manufacturers make, right? So, I think... Yeah, you know, to, to, to Aldo's point, we're not against it, right? But I think the rest of the world has to be given the time also to, to catch up. And it's not just Asia Pacific, it's also, it's also Latin America, you know. Um, you know, it's not that we are crazy and we're going around deforesting uh, places because we feel like it. But it's also a question of, of uh, uh, economics on the ground, education. Um, and then at the end of the day, yeah, half the product still stays in Asia. And you know the, the the ability for the populations that consume it to afford, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about over the last two days, the traceability systems and all that, is 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 unclear. Then you know you say, yeah, fine, we make the West pay for it, and uh, and uh, the rest of us uh, enjoy it, the, the the side benefit of it for 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 free. 
also doesn't sound so equitable in today's world. So I don't have an answer for you, but uh, you know, it is, uh, it is an open question, right? But I mean, to, to the question, yes, it, it is not the end of mass balance because there is still a significant portion of consumers out there that cannot afford it. Clear. And so if we have a spectrum where on the one hand we have a desire for full traceability, you know, with all the positive aspects that it brings, and on the other hand we have a big market reality, you know, all the way down to a thousand rupiah little piece of chocolate, which would no longer be there, to simplify it very much, if the price went up because of traceability. Could you, before we go to Paul, because I think it's actually important enough, also give your perspective, Brian. So where do you position the U.S. market on that spectrum? Yeah, it, it, it's it's a great question. I mean, as as Alvin was talking there, I was I was trying to think through right. Like the last thing we want to we want to do here is create a race to the bottom. Um, and you know, it, I think it goes back to the the core notion that that the farmer has to be bought in um, on on what on what's happening here. It has to be across the sector. Um, you know, I think the indirect supply issue is is an elephant in the room. Um, and I don't have a solution for it. Um, I don't know how we get around that, but you know, I think it's it's easy for us in rooms like this to say we should do X, Y, and Z, but uh, when it comes to implementation, and we heard this in some of the panels yesterday, those are, these are difficult decisions for, for farmers and families. Um, and there aren't easy answers all the time, but what, what, what does the market sustain? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I do worry that you know, we, we create a race to the bottom um, if the entire supply chain is not included and in, in what, you know, what the EU and, and the US are contemplating. I also worry about what, to Alvin's point, what the market is going to sustain. Uh, I don't know the answers to that question. Um, you know, in, in, in one, I've been shocked at the number of, of chocolate um, retailers here in, in Brussels. My goodness, that's literally on every corner. Um, we don't quite have that in the United it's States. Paradise. You guys really love your chocolate. But, you know, our industry, you know, embraces uh, the notion that, that that candy and chocolate are a treat. Um, it is part of an emotional well-being, emotional health. Um, everyone should have access to that. That that kid buying that 10 cent bag should have access to that enjoyment. That's it's one of the best parts of life, right? Um, so let's not lose you know sight of I think the larger picture here um, as we're trying to deal with very difficult and in, in, in the weeds decisions. I, I think. I don't have answers to the question, but we okay. need to that's too bad. No, but I think you uh, you highlighted the challenge in a different way, and you made it clearer in the process. Um, so this is very complicated, and a lot of the times I've heard, well, these people in Brussels, they don't listen and they don't understand. If only they understood the market reality. If only we would have a bit more time to explain it. Um, Paul, is that? something that you recognize. In a way, you are there, I suppose, spending a large part of your job explaining these kind of different, difficult market realities to Brussels. How is that conversation going? Well, I think everyone's aligned, quite honestly. Okay. Um, I think the, the, the key thing that we're always going to say as a trade, and we're never going to stop saying it, and we're never going to be embarrassed saying it, we need efficiencies in the market. That, that, is, that benefits consumers and that benefits farmers. End of story. It really does. What we do, we have to be very good at what we do. And I think the point about uh, national traceability systems that you're asking at the beginning, I think would be very, very welcome. It, it is complicated, you're absolutely right, because we've got data protection, we've got a whole load of things that we have to be very, very careful about in terms of trying to trace five to eight million farms you know, in West Africa. You know, that's, that's a pretty big job. Um, and, you know, to hold that data correctly, to be held accountable for one mistake in five million, this kind of thing, we, we've got to think that through. <laughs> to us, it's a process. I think we all believe that. But we've got to make sure that the farmer is getting paid properly at the end of it. And to do that, we need to be efficient. Where I think the branded businesses have done so much good is that they've been challenged over the last 20 years to connect. Um, and I think in terms of how the, the market was forces were kind of driving um, the industrialization of chocolate. You know, when I started 35 years ago, there were probably 30 or 40 bean, no, that's an exaggeration, 15 bean processors in Belgium alone. And I think there's one now, maybe two, who actually process beans. That, that's a process of consolidation that's been going around the world for a long period of time. 
the chocolate industry has really connected back up. Um, and it's done that, I think, largely through trying to, traceability is a methodology to do that. And I think that you know, having identity preserved, making sure that there is a real connection is actually very, very important for those brands. It may not be the solution for the whole market. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I thought I was shouting loud enough. Um, excuse me. Um, so I think, I think it's, it may not be the solution for everything. I think what we have to recognize is that it may not be the right time to say, let's go for the gold standard at the very, very beginning, because we may have to recognize that this is a process towards rebuilding one farmer incomes. And I'm going to keep saying it because I feel they need to be represented in this room. And we do believe in that. And I think on the other side of it, we want consumer confidence that we're not damaging the environment, that human rights are being protected um, in what we eat. I don't, think that's a, I don't think that's a complicated proposition. Um, but I think to get to Nirvana uh, is not an overnight process, and I think we've got to recognize that. Okay, excellent. I'm setting the bar even higher in the process. We're not aiming just for a thriving, sustainable cocoa sector, but we're aiming for, aiming for Nirvana, and it might take a little while. Fair enough. Just to be very clear, it is Nirvana. So it is Nirvana. We're actually already... Once, once you get there, once you get there. Um, so that's, so a lot of things need to happen, and what we haven't, actually surprisingly, I think across the conference haven't talked about that much yet, I mean, we can argue over price, but I don't think we've talked a lot about where are the resources going to come from, who are going to fund this incredible transition that we have just articulated just a few aspects of, really. Um, We've seen with CFI that's challenging. I know, Chris, that you've set it up a little bit already in that panel for those of you who were not there, hoping that the financial sector will come in on this in some form. So maybe you could start there and share a little bit. How, how do you see this evolve? How are we going to find this immense transition which will require immense resources? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so, so I think the starting point is there's a huge, huge array of funders here. Um, so I think if you start from one extreme uh, where we've already seen um, funding from uh, for CFI, but it's on smaller scale, but it is pure sort of donor project sponsorship for small parts of CFI, funding government secretariats, that kind of funding. Um, and then you can go completely to the other extreme where if we can get the carbon piece right, there is full commercial funding against those carbon streams. Um, and in the middle, which is an area that we haven't, necessarily touch, but which is, I think, really the sweet spot um, for us going forward is development finance going into the development finance institutions. Um, so, and then I, there's another piece in there that I didn't mention, which is the foundation piece. So there is a whole array of different financings and different funders, all of whom have different criteria. But I think if you look across, um, if, you, if you exclude the commercial piece, which only will take the carbon revenue, that's the only justification it will take, but across the development piece, um, yeah, almost by definition, deforestation and living income are things that development funders want to fund. So we always have to remember, you never get a funder to change their mandate. So you look at what their mandate says, and you know, climate change is always on that list. Um, and deforestation is pretty close and almost invariably is on that list. So I think now it is a matter of focus. Um, it is a matter of, which we have, a program that is advanced reaching a state of maturity with a track record of delivery. It has governments involved. Um, and as I said earlier, what these funders want to see is, is sort of two things. They want to see private money they're investing alongside, uh, and they need to tick the additionality box. They need to be able to bring something beyond just the dollars, but it's in the spot. It's in their mandate. So I think there are plenty of sources. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I don't think we'll have time for a whole lot more, but I just want to... I'm going to set you up, Chris, with the most impossible answer, I think, or most impossible question of the entire conference to conclude us with. To set that up, I think we should expand it even wider because, as we've seen on this conference, this is not just about West Africa. This is even not just about this small country called Asia. It is far beyond this. Uh, this is really a truly global industry in every sense of the word. 
So if I could ask all of you again briefly, and then I'm going to just have this knockout question to Chris, how he's going to solve all of that. I'll give you the little, <laughs> little heads up to give some time to think about it, otherwise it would be too mean. But so, so what do you think is sort of the frontier that we haven't talked about in this conference? We've talked about the US, we've talked about Asia. Where is an area that you think is coming that we should be paying attention to that perhaps we are not? I'll start with you, Brian, and then we'll just go down. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I'll, I'll take it back home to the United States. Um, we're going to have an election in, in 11 or 12 days to determine control of the Congress. Um, it's likely that control of the House of Representatives, our, our larger uh, legislative body, is going to flip to Republican control. And they have already promised that committees of jurisdiction are going to hold hearings um, and bring CEOs of corporations um, in to tell to tell the Congress why they are quote unquote woke capitalists. Um, so that's going to happen uh, if the House flips, which most prognos prognosticators think it will. And I think that that is something that that in in our country has to be has to be noted. Um, not that the you know it, the the issues that that they are focusing on are ESG. Um, you know they will bring banks in in to testify CEOs of banks. Uh, why they're not investing in certain sectors, why they're doing things that are not just shareholder value but are, are moral value type of issues. Um, obviously, you, you all wouldn't discuss this in a European context, but, but that's, that's what we're facing in the United States. I think that, that there is going to be a continued push and pull. Corporations are going to try and continue to do the right things. Of course, there's, there's more just beyond shareholder value, and shareholders in many cases are demanding ESG activities. Um, but we've got, a, you know, one, one of the parties in our country is going to be sort of pulling back corporate um, activity or attempting to pull back corporate activity on ESG goals. Thank you. The problem, it's probably what you, you weren't expecting me to say that. <laughs> well, no, I, I think as we continue this ominous, ominous round, I think we'll get increasingly worried, and then, but then we'll have Chris to solve it for us right in the end. Paul, what do you think, uh, again, this, the same question, what are we not paying enough attention to that we should be? I think we're paying attention to all the right things. I, um, what we've got to do is get a win. And I think we've got to decide what a win looks like. Um, and to me, that looks like 20 years from now that we're sitting in this room, uh, having cooperated across various parts of the sector, we're all looking for the same thing. Um, and let's uh, sit around and spend five minutes because we can get a, a slide up that says, look, we did it. Um, you know, we've stopped deforestation, you know, we've got a product that people are happy with. The farmer price in 20 years' time is something that is good um, and satisfying and is going to be helpful and productive in the long term. It's a great product with a huge amount of uh, kind of emotional attachment. And look, you know, that's what we're all doing sitting here. Um, you know, we believe in, in this sector. So I don't see a problem. You know, I, I just see we've just got to decide and agree and cooperate. What does a win look like and get there? Excellent. Dr. Nirvana, Aldo. Yeah, let me add to what Paul said. Obviously, that was my dream 20 years ago. Uh, hopefully, in 20 years' time, <laughs> it, it, it will be through. But again, here, we heard today the word landscape approach, for instance, and that shows that it's not only about cocoa. We in the confectionery industry obviously have different commodities and different ingredients. And ideally we have that approach and that, let's say, level where we are in cocoa, also in other commodities where sometimes we are lagging behind. And I think what industry in cocoa has been so far been engaging. Um, you see, the due diligence discussion is not only about commodities. You have it everywhere in the car industry, in the chemical industry, and if I talk to all these uh, different uh, categories, I see how far we are in cocoa. That gives me hope that we drag the others into the same direction, and if we have done that throughout, ideally throughout the world, then we are in Nirvana, as Pauli was saying, and that would be the greatest success, to be at the front runner and to push and to get the others on the same level. Excellent, thank you. Alvin. Yeah, so maybe I, 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 I can paraphrase in terms of more, you know, what do we need to see more of to avoid, you know, uh, coming here and saying that Aldo's dream is uh, 20 years later still not fulfilled. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the, the fact that we have had voices over the last two days from different parts of the world, 
you know, I think that provides different ideas, different solutions, different contexts, and, and a bit more empathy on, on how things can be done, right? I think there, 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 there is so much to be learned from different ways of working, right? And, and I think we can learn a lot from, you know, what has worked and as much as from what hasn't worked in other parts of the world, right? In, in terms of trying to then apply it to what we want to try and achieve here uh, in the EU, right? So I think that's, that's the one thing. Um, you know, I've come away from, from the two days here, you know, a lot more informed and, and, and knowledgeable. And hopefully, you know, with some of the connections that I've made, can also help to bring some of, um, you know, what needs to be done in the Asian landscape, you know, help to advance that to make, you know, what is uh, basically being lobbied for here, a, a, a thriving cocoa supply chain for all, right? Um, I think, I think uh, more cross-cultural idea exchanges always help. I've, I've been fortunate to be in Coco for 15 years. You know, um, I've seen incredible things done in Peru. I've seen incredible things being done in, uh, in Indonesia, in Malaysia back in the day, uh, and, and obviously uh, in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire and in, uh, in Ghana. I mean, there is a lot of good ideas out there, and I think we need to apply context to a lot of things that we're trying to do. I think too often we, we, we do a one-size-fits-all approach in the name of efficiency, maybe, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I think if, we, if we, we, we keep the conversations going, we have a little bit more cultural cross-border curiosity, I think we can get there. Okay, excellent. Well, Chris, the, the panel already flipped it for you, so you don't have to do that anymore. Um, it's been called many things now. It's uh, all those dream, chocolate nirvana, um, the answer to a crisis, many, many things. In closing, and in you know, sending us home with this conference, what I wanted to ask you is sort of how do you do this really? Because I've been in your company three times now, and all those three times, a new country came up with a new issue that wasn't even addressed here. So how do you manage an organization with already membership organization, which is, I've been an advisor to many of them, it's a very special kind of hell. It's really, really a challenging job. <laughs> How do you manage that from a truly global perspective? And maybe what have you gotten from this conference that helps you do that? Um, well, I think the first thing we can say, and I, I can say this genuinely, it was, it, we, having gone through the strategy refresh process, uh, the, you know, the board have, have agreed that we need to have a glo more global approach. Uh, and clearly, you know, what everybody said on this panel, it, we need to be more global. So. Uh, the days, uh, as I understand, we've been called of being the Washington or the West African Cocoa Foundation are hopefully over. Um, and what does that mean? I mean, I, I think that means it's, it's a recognition of, you know, if we legislative agenda, we've got to be considering the US and Europe. You know, there's two major streams going there. Um, there's all the other markets, there's all the other farmer models, there's all the other learnings, there's the same issues, there's different issues. You know, we have to be, at the very least, aware of what's going on in other markets. So. Um, from where we are right now, it's a resource issue, so we've got to be targeted and focused. Um, I think Peter Boone said yesterday, you know, he sources from 42 countries. Well, clearly we can't do that. Um, so we can't cover that. We can't pick up knowledge and relationships in all those countries. So we will prioritize. Um, I think um, if you look at West Africa, logically, uh, as Cameroon and uh, Nigeria move into the joint initiative, you know, those are logical countries to expand into. Um, we already have activities that we haven't focused on particularly well in Brazil and Colombia. Um, so those are also opportunities. So we need to look at the globe and, and focus on um, resources, but the principle is now established. Um, I think for me, the most sort of telling thing, I think Dan, IDH, both of sort of winced at this, is, you know, if we look at CFI and we look at, you know, as I said earlier, we look at CFI, we're talking about moving deforestation now into discussions about restoration. You know, the focus is, you know, should our focus be moving to countries where re deforestation is the real risk, where we look at Cameroon and then you look at Congo. You know, that's another conversation. That's another area where we need to look. So I think all I can say today without much, you know, I can't give you specifics today. What I can be specific about is the outlook has changed and we will be global and world Cocoa Foundation going forward. Exactly what that means. Uh, give me a few months. Excellent. I think we will. Um, on that, ladies and gentlemen, you hold your applause for just a few more seconds um, as you send uh, Chris Vincent off into his new job, now official, uh, new leadership for the World Cocoa Foundation, 
many new challenges, but also I think a lot of ideas on stage and off stage and 350 people in the room genuinely really willing to work towards um, what by many dreams, what by many names we can call something else, but we all have the same vision for what this chocolate sector should look like in the end. So thank you more than anything um, and more than anyone for being here, being here to the end and really contributing these two past days. I've had an amazing time and I also think and hope it was very productive. Thank you and thank you to the panel. Thank you. Well,